Okay. Yeah. Welcome to week six. And uh, today we will have two presentations. One from Lemon Line Labs with Justin, and second one will be mine. So um, after that we will go through some of our. Uh, we will have our grant presentations from next week. And uh, till now, JC has registered for grant request, and Abdul has registered. So uh, we will go through the rules after uh, we are done with uh, today's meeting. So uh, I would like to call Justin uh, to start with the presentation. So to get, give you guys a little bit of background on what we're going to go through tonight. So for um, this discussion, these are going to be materials that were prepared for uh, the Accelerate Michigan competition. The first one will be a video, kind of go through and show that to you, and then also the, uh, the presentation. So there's a short presentation that kind of goes after that um, that will be delivered next week, and, uh, and hopefully you get some feedback on, on both of them. So we'll start with the video, and then if, if you guys, as we go through it, afterwards can provide a little bit of feedback um, as far as the product and, and give you a little sense of how that video went. So, go ahead, sorry. Advancements in vehicle design have reduced injury and death rates around the world. However, car crashes still remain one of the leading causes of injury-related deaths. Motor vehicle safety has gained public awareness, with manufacturers building components capable of saving a human life in merely a fraction of a second. Crash test dummies serve as a tool to analyze the effects of a crash event on the human body. To position crash test dummies within the test environment, researchers commonly use portable coordinate measuring machines, such as articulated arms. Articulated arms are often expensive, bulky, and frustrating to maneuver. The inspiration for this project came after working in the crash safety field, and this work demonstrated an obvious pain point for many users. Our goal at Lemon Line Labs is to develop a measurement product that is intuitive right out of the box, providing mobility and ease of use. This measurement system comprises of a base and a probe paired with a user interface. Multiple computer devices, like smartphones, tablets, or laptops, will display the digital position to the user. Both a proof of concept and a working prototype have been developed that remotely tracks the position and orientation of a handheld probe, providing real-time data collection. We are striving for a level of integration with mobile devices currently not offered in the crash safety industry, making the end user's experience easier. Our target customers are independent laboratories, vehicle suppliers, and vehicle manufacturers. The hidden in-process expenses that are often incurred during product development can be dramatically reduced using this tool. By offering accuracy paired with increased usability, we can positively advance the crash safety industry. One of the important needs in the vehicle crash test uh, industry is to be able to place crash test dummies in a highly repeatable manner from test to test. Typically what's done in the industry is to use either a robotic type coordinate measuring device or a laser device in order to get dummies in the same posture and location every time. A portable wireless device would be a great innovation that would make this process easier and more efficient, especially in the tight confinement of a typical vehicle interior surrounded by expert advisors and industry professionals. We are building products capable of providing advancements to a wide range of industrial applications. Lemon Line Labs, precision in every dimension. All right, so per Eric's request, um, can we get a little bit of feedback on what this product uh, is? What was your initial impressions of it? What, what, what are we actually trying to accomplish? Because I think that this is something that, um, especially, um, the people surrounded around me and have been involved in this project, you know, Tamakoli has seen it obviously, have a pretty good idea of what this industry looks like. But to people that haven't ever seen it, what what impression does this really give? Does anybody have any feedback? I, I can tell that you're trying to measure something, but I didn't really know what you're exactly measuring. I just thought you were kind of, I, I would like an explanation of like what was actually being measured and how that was. So I think that what was shown up there was really just showing capturing points. It wasn't actually really 
no, no, it, it was just showing, I guess, the environment that you could operate in. Okay. And uh, the, the main goal, though, is going back to crash safety and positioning dummies themselves. So I think um, in the follow-up presentation, we'll add it'll it'll kind of reflect a lot of this, and it'll go on and add add onto that, and hopefully add a little bit more depth. But is there any other any other feedback? Is it? I mean, is it totally totally confusing right now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I heard this already existed. I mean, do they, or is this a completely no. new product? This is a, this would be new for the. This industry, yeah. Okay. Well, we use a lot of CMM devices where I work, and um, a friend of mine that works there, he said they used to use wireless ones where he worked. I don't know what he meant by wireless, if it was a little device like that, but he did say wireless. So wireless would be uh, laser laser systems. Okay. Is a lot of what they go to. So that's a line of sight system. Okay. So why would a line of sight work here? Is that your question? No. What is now? We'll get into that later. Okay. Well, I guess, I think the one thing that would help, though, is uh, when Valerie was measuring, mm -hmm. if you would demonstrate it with a dummy in a vehicle and make make the consumer understand why it's such a pain in the ass to use a ferro arm inside of a vehicle, I think that would have helped a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Great device, otherwise, it would be perfect for what I do. Is this the PowerPoint? Yeah, this is the PowerPoint. Okay, okay let's, so let's that hopefully that professor guy was great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was awesome. <laughs> so, so we'll see if we can we can kind of elaborate on his awesomeness and go from there. So, um, so you can throw away the rest. Of it. <laughs> can you, uh, it's not operating. Yeah. No. Yep. So, kind of. Reflecting off of that, I mean, obviously we know the crash safety industry is, is improving greatly in leaps and bounds every year. And one of the main unsung heroes from that is, is obviously crash test dummies. So they, they allow researchers, researchers to really take a look at the seat belts, the airbags, understand the interactions of those dummies with their surrounding interior environments. So when we're looking at just a dummy, this is kind of outside the vehicle, you're not, not in a tight constrained environment, how, how is this dummy positioned? We're looking for consistency and repeatability between test to test to really gain an understanding of how those tests have changed. We, you don't want this dummy just positioned anywhere here. So the way that's often done is measured off of these main points. So when we're looking at a three-dimensional environment, this is obviously 2D, but we're looking to position the hip three-dimensionally, cross car, front to back, up down. So, as mentioned in the video, this kind of shows the, the constraints of the arm trying to just measure out these points. So it's just trying to capture points in this environment, and actually this point it actually misses. It's not even large enough to capture that outermost point. So the problem that's really found in this industry is the inability for the users to really connect effortlessly with their environment. So that three-dimensional environment is difficult. You look at that previous operation with the the the, the arm, it, it takes two hands to operate. So when you're trying to, to move a dummy while moving this arm, it's often difficult. And especially when you're um, interacting with geometric constraints like a vehicle body or, or any other uh, hard object. So this is the solution that we're proposing right now. So this is um, a wireless coordinate measurement system featuring a base that's mounted by the user to the, to the ground or somewhere around there, and then a probe. So this probe allows the user to interact with that base remotely, and then the base will communicate with a paired wireless interface to allow the user to understand their environment. So what are the three main features that users currently aren't being, um, or their problems aren't really being addressed, and that, that really focuses on the connectivity, mobility, and efficiency. So up till now, researchers have made do with what's there, but these are the, the features that haven't been really addressed to their extent. So through connectivity, how can we address that in a way that helps the user? It's always focused back on solving the problems for the user. Intertwining the hardware and the software. Bringing together a software interface that's designed specifically for an improved user experience. How do you make that user 
connected with their environment? How do you immerse them in that environment? And one of the ways is also to access it through a smartphone, a tablet, any other handheld device other than just a laptop. The, obviously, a laptop can be used now, but how do we make it just one more step ahead? How do we free them from the constraints around them? So the mobility. So that kind of speaks a little bit to that mobility of allowing um, no, you know, a wireless interface. That gives you a user freedom. You're, you have a smaller package. It's a compact design that allows you to actually have easy transportation. You can take it into the field. That's really one of the main benefits. You can pack this up. You can take it on a plane, and you can go into the field and, and, and take uh, 3D point data. And then efficiency. Improved cycle time. So even speaking on the two previous points, all those are contributing to the efficiency. But the main, the main driver of that is the fact that we can add multiple probes to a single system, allowing multiple users to be operating all at once. So you can have um, several probes. Instead of buying multiple arms, you just add multiple probes. It's, it's a lot cheaper, and it allows the users to connect a lot easier. And they can all connect over a, uh, a mobile device platform, all communicating back to the main central uh, data collection center. So if we take a, take a look at the graph as far as um, connectivity and mobility, how, how, does, how does this system really stack up with, with the competitors in the field right now? So taking a look at articulated arms, the ones manufactured by Faro and Romer, they kind of fall a lot further down. They're not very well connected. They're, they're, wi they're uh, wired, they often are hardwired, and they don't have the, uh, the mobility that's required. You have, to, you have a, large, um, a large box that you have to transport around if you're trying to to move it from uh, job site to job site. And then you look at laser systems. These aren't used as often in, in dummy setting, uh, mostly because of the line of sight. If you have a vehicle body in the way, it's difficult to do it. One of the most beneficial ways of using lasers is, is straight down the center, setting a dummy center line. But it's still not often that, that used. Th these uh, systems manufactured by Leica and Nikon are often more used for large distance measurement as opposed to, uh, to dummy setting. And so then, this is kind of where we'd be sitting right now. High connectivity. We can connect with a lot of different devices and then high mobility. Now, that's kind of all speaking to the, the good. Maybe what's, maybe what's not so good about it. So if we take a look at cost and we take a look at accuracy and, and compare that, laser systems, highly accurate, but you also pay for it. And it's much the same for articulated arms. You're paying a lot for a high degree of accuracy. You know, you have accuracy within uh, a human hair is, is that really what's necessary in the craft safety industry? Our answer is no. So one millimeter of accuracy is plenty for somebody that's setting a dummy to an accuracy of within 10 millimeters. That's plenty. And then at the cost point that they can come in at, that allows a low barrier to entry and allows them a, a lot easier a way of setting the dummies. So who are the, who are the customers? Obviously, it's the craft safety industry. That's not hard to figure out. But who within the craft safety industry? So vehicle manufacturers, a lot of OEMs run multiple tests a year, uh, testing full vehicles and also on, uh, on uh, partial body vehicles, and then component suppliers. So testing uh, child safety seats or uh, seat belts, anything like that, and then independent crash laboratories, just like the one over in the mock. Very clever. So the crash safety industry is a niche market that's very small, but there's a broader market outside of that. So you look at the automotive metrology market in general, that's a 800 million dollar market but where do you go beyond that where's that broader market outside of the automotive industry and really it's going to machine shops I mean automotive is tied into this but the machine shops and the fab labs really have uh, a need for some of this for when you take and bring a product that is a low barrier entry it's a lot more attainable for them to bring it in and use it in-house so who are the key partners the automotive industry is obviously the major key partners really getting the manufacturers on board, really getting the engineers on board, but more importantly, the team. And I think that right now, the team we have in place and the advisors around us, we have a lot of experience in automotive. But if we look at the, uh, the other key uh, industries, electronics and software, those are where key partners are going to be required. We need to have experienced people coming out of both of those industries to build this product and take it, take it to the next level. So what does the future look like? Obviously, the focus is still based on the customer. It's still focused on connectivity, mobility, and efficiency. How do we always continue to bring the best to those customers? And that's through, obviously, 
as I mentioned before, mobile applications. But the benefit to mobile applications is really the talk to text. These features that allow the user to input data and collect their data more effectively, more efficiently. And then also integrating CAD systems, allow that user to become immersed in their environment. And then beyond that, laser systems that would allow um, to be mounted to the device itself and scan it for a, a line of sight measurement, but more for reverse engineering and allow the user to um, also pull in some of that information too as, as they're developing stuff. So I think as far as we go forward, hopefully this kind of gave a little bit better of, a, of an understanding of what we're trying to do. And then if you guys have any more questions, I think that that, that pretty much wraps it up and we can just discuss anything you guys have. Um, the industry I work in, I work in construction equipment manufacturing, and you talk about the automotive industry, but a lot of that seems real small, but I use a lot of that at work, and you have to transport it around you have to get on one side of the machine to the other, you have to pack it up and move it, let's say, like uh, a front end loader that's, you know, the length of this room, you're not talking, like, you, precision, you're talking about thousands of an inch or a millimeter, that's good enough for most of that industry. Yeah. I think that's... That that's one of the major benefits is you take a ferro arm, you can only get maybe 12 foot radius around it, right? You put this in there and you can get 20, 25 foot radius of freedom. You know, so you can encompass a lot of a room, you can encompass larger parts. And I think that's really where it opens up to industries that didn't think of using something like that before and then say, hey, what about this now? Would there be problems with interference? Like if you're inside of a vehicle, all mill around you, is that going to, to throw this off? And so right now, um, our, our alpha prototype, yes, very much so. So we're working on a second beta uh, prototype that would address those issues and be able to uh, make sure that that interference is not there. You have a plan forward for that? Are there, so there's not software people on your team, is that correct? But your plan forward would include? Yes. Yep. It, it, would, it would have to be integrated with very key software and key electrical engineers. Yes. And at that time, at this time, you don't have that on your team, but um, you're you're working in that direction. Yep. So right now, I think that we're at the stage where it's 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 going to be growing and figuring out who those who those players are for that team. Right now, the the prototype that's been built up till now. Hopefully, can sustain it into bringing into bringing investors on board, bringing funding on board that can help bring that team team in. And you think you can overcome that? Yeah. Okay. Um, are there are there exist are there existing mobile applications for like something that's similar to this? Like the other companies or concepts that are out there? Just, do they have applications as well on the phones? Or as of right now, no. So they, okay, they, so you'd also be the first one yeah. to put it in the mobile. Yep. So industry. that would definitely open up the mobile industry that hasn't been hasn't even been looked at right now. Most of their stuff is built; it's hard coded into their their arms. So they'll have a flip out little touch screen, or they'll 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 upload it straight to a, a laptop. But they haven't integrated it into anything beyond that. Interesting. Can you explain how it would be a benefit to to be able to use a smartphone? do this? Yeah, so I think that really the main point is if you looked at the ferro arm and that's that's uh, wired uh, wired up the laptop. So if, you, if your arm's sitting here and for whatever reason you have your laptop over there, you have to walk back and forth to put in the, put in the data. Really what it comes into here is you can mount the base wherever you want and now you're free to walk and do whatever you, wherever you want to go. So if I'm walking up to this chair and I say this is chair point one, I take chair point one, it locks and loads the point, and it's registered that talk to text. And now chair point two, I just go on to the next point. Instead of walking back to the to the workspace and constantly having to re-input data, that's where it allows you that flexibility to start working right off here, and then you can upload that data later when you're using it and analyzing it. I think I don't really understand the, the process there, um, uh, what what the need is for that. So you're not you're not Looking at your phone and, and it it's not telling you that you're out of tolerance. It's or, just, or you can do that. Yeah. It's just a way for your your device to communicate with um, the software, a larger software package. Yeah. 
or for that that point too, you can be looking at your phone and tell, okay, I know this point should be here, and it's not. So yeah, I mean, and you it, if you're not locking data and you're just checking for um, for accuracy and consistency amongst the part run, then for that case, you're not saving any data. It's fine. But if you're saving data, you can be saving it off to a to a system, All right. separate from the phone. I mean, like, is it? I'm not sure if like how to explain this, but like, how is it going to be really difficult to have like this sort of like software? Do you do you guys know like if it's like how difficult it is to have it on not only your laptop but have it with your phone? It would Does that be, require like a cloud, cloud-based operating system? Mm -hmm. You have an answer to that? Um, well, okay, so that's going to be like later stage. That's like maybe second phase, but the first phase is going to be just simply having a desktop application. So right now the Faro Arm in particular has um, a piece of software that has um, just a simple table and um, a graphing feature. Or it doesn't even have a graphing feature. Even it's just very simple, and it has a live data box that has um, the points in x, y, z coordinates. But with what the the first step would be for us is to implement that, and then take it a step further, maybe with like charting, uh, which isn't too hard, um, if, or graphing. But then the the next vision uh, is to make it into you know if you have a cloud server that. Uh, you know, has the database and anything that uh, you can save off your point data to an XML file or and load it again if you need that data for later. But then you can access it on your phone too, because then, say, if an industry leader of some sort or, or, or some technician is like they do all this stuff or take all their points uh, in um, you know a car setting or, or where whatever environment. And then they go on a plane to some place, and they need to remember. Okay, I need you know such and such. Uh, f or this is the points that we had for this data, or and we can re-implement the same demo at a different crash safety center. Then it would be very simple, and that goes into the same um, th uh, three aspects that we were trying to look for, which was connectivity. Um, so we still are connected to the same data that we need. And then um, it's still mobile. It's very mobile. You, you can be across the country and still access it. But that's, that's way beyond what the competition has for right now. So that's just, we were just giving you a broader view of our vision of, you know, product line. So. Yeah, I think really right at this time, it's, it's just launching one product at a time, right? And, and this is just, the, the potential is there. And that's really what this is. is Beyond the prototype, there's there's potential there. Yeah, I think like I don't know if there's like there is like any type of free software that is in the mobile industry. Um, I can't think of any on top of my head. There might be, but I mean that'd be awesome if you guys could like take it a step further. Maybe be, like the first to put like some sort of three D application prototype or development. Application in the mobile industry as well. Interesting. Good. Is there is there a way to increase the accuracy, like with multiple bases or something like that, or? Oh, that's the something we're still looking to, and we're still working on. I think that it, it it would be it would be coming down to something like that, or the um, or sensor sensitivity, just yeah. in, improving it. I mean, you can inject a lot of cost into it, and probably do a lot. Right now, just with that target, that's our one target. We're not trying to go beyond that one millimeter. Yes, if I heard you right, with one transponder, you can have multiple probes moving the same device and just fill the data. Yeah. Right? That, that's quite an advantage. I don't think any other system can do that right now. That, that's one of the key things that I think is so exciting about that, is yeah. that you can, if you take it and you can place it in a vehicle and you can have four people setting yeah, can whatever around really the whole entire clear. vehicle. And, and so instead of spending 100000 per ferro arm, which would be, if you had four of them, 400000 it cuts the cost way down. And 
you don't have to upload all the data together and merge it. It's all merged together. Once. Actually, the four ferro arms can't communicate with the same laptop. They would be communicating to a separate laptop. That's right. You own. can't. You can't. You have to save off the data, and then you right. have to put it all. Together. And they all have different reference yep. points, so you can't even resolve yep. that. Well, if you re if it's all if they're all tied back into a CAD data that they know they already know what the points they're referencing are, then right. yeah, you could. Then you could. You could overlay yeah, it. Yeah, then you could. So you, you need to play that up. That's quite an advantage. I think really right now is a lot of people don't really understand that. Well, you need to make them understand. It's yeah. your pitch, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think you 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 glossed over that very quickly in your pitch. Okay. I think that's a huge advantage. Yeah, uh, probably even more so than the ease of use of the wireless. So of course it starts with that. It starts yeah. with look, this is wireless. This is easy to use, and I agree with the comment. Maybe in your next video version, uh, you know, Valerie should be working on something that's really cumbersome, yeah. not not just open space. Uh, but that's one. You start with that, but you immediately should move into, man, multiple people can communicate with the same cloud point, just dump data into it. You're not tied into a laptop, you're not tied into these positions. I think that's a hell of an advantage. I hadn't heard that from you before. I picked up on it tonight. Yeah, and, and that's actually where that's the, I think the largest amount of cost and time saving comes in is when you're setting up for a, a side impact um, and you're setting a front and rear dummy. Yeah. You, instead of setting the one dummy, moving it around, you can set it up all at once. Very quickly. Right. And the one, sorry. I just had a question about what you were asking. Mm -hmm. um, so, are you speaking from a crash safety expert type of point of view? Or are you thinking, like, for you know, people who are trying to invest in this, would that be something that is um, not really a point to drive home, or you know, because I know no, it is a point advantage. to drive home. But how do you do that in a simple layman's terms? Like. I see you and Justin, like, you know, you know exactly what you're talking about. No, I'm about. not talking about crash safety. I mean, I'm actually seeing, th seeing this as a generic measurement device, right? Yeah. By the way, my suggestion to you guys is to look at the construction industry mm -hmm. and use it as a digital remote tape measure. Well, yeah, that's... Yeah. that's I, I really think that's the that. huge market, but right now we're yeah. focused on crash safety, right? Right. So in the crash safety, of course, if you're just positioning a dummy, probably one person is enough. But there's also body measurements, like they need to measure different points on the vehicle, mm -hmm. which they usually do either with a laser scanner or with a ferro arm, except you have to move it several times yeah. to get the entire body in. Mm -hmm. There's a full body scan. These car models that people make, the digital car models, mm -hmm. are full body scans. Okay. Yeah. There, you could have six people run through that thing in a minute with six probes. Yeah. Instead of one person, you know, doing this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, I think that's a hell of an advantage that you can have multiple people doing the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Maybe also look for another one, you know, positioning a three-dimensional object somewhere. If three people have to locate three points at the same time so you can position it. Oh, interesting. I don't know what the application would be for that, but one person couldn't do that, right? I mean, you would have to place it. Yeah. Oh, it's wrong. So then you shift it. So you place it. Hands. It's wrong. Yeah. That's, that's you know. a problem we're also addressing. Yeah, you could dynamically do that if you had three probes yeah. at the same time. Interesting. Yeah, you, you got a lot of flexibility here. I believe. Okay. But one last thing. The one piece that's missing here, if I were kind of an investor type, is your competition. Now, I know you talked about laser, and you talked about ferro arms, and you're using that to show your advantage. But at the same time, I'm not convinced that there is not another wireless data transferring device out there. Maybe it's not used for crash safety. Maybe it's not used for measurement. So I need to get confidence that you, you know if there is such a thing out there or not. Because those are the companies that could jump on this, right? As soon as you put the idea out, because they already have the software developers and all of that. So I need to hear a little bit more about that. I didn't hear that. You know, the NABC, the need approach, benefit, and then the competition. You know, who's the competition? But so. if they have a <coughs> registered a patent that this kind of technology, mm. so they will be secured in market, right? That's not, again, if we're talking to a venture capitalist, that's mm -hmm. the start, right? Mm -hmm. But the second thing they want to know, I mean, after you protect your technology is, who else can get into that market and run ahead of you? 
by making a little difference to the patent or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know, we always want to know where's the state of the company. You want to know that, right? And you have to give the, 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 the people that are listening to you confidence that you've studied that, that you know who, you, who your potential threats are. So that, that piece was missing. I mean, you, you did a good job on the laser people and on the faro arm, and you clearly showed that this is a superior device to that. Okay, but so who, who can jump on this technology? And by the way, your competitors can also become your distribution chain. Those are the ones that you potentially could sell the technology to, right? That's another reason you want to know your competitors. So maybe that piece needs a little research. Yeah, I mean, right now I think the biggest thing is there is a lot of 2D mm -hmm. based stuff, but not so much in the 3D. I think it's just they haven't really found the applications where it's really necessary. I think that this is, this well, is it, right? So. Well, at least touch on that. Who's a 2D? And again, I'm looking at the features. It's wireless. And, and by the way, uh, the reason some people were confused between the laser and this, maybe you ought to introduce this as a wireless touch probe, okay. as opposed to a yep. wireless measurement system, yep. right? Yep. So this literally touches the object. Yep. So maybe terminology. But is the main feature here is a wireless data transmitting uh, touch probe. Yep. Is there something like that out there? I, and I think in 2D there is, because there are these digitizers that you can move over a map and send data. Those would be the people that could quickly transfer their technology to this, right? Also, in so. the, uh, the medical industry, there's uh, electromagnetic uh, sensing ability to, you know, in CAT scans and mm -hmm. such, um, where, but, but I guess the difference between our product and that would be that it's not electromagnetic but we don't want to talk about the No, yeah, I'm not talking about what's inside of it. Yeah. I'm talking about the application itself. Who out oh. there is wirelessly transmitting digital data of measuring something? Well, that's what I'm saying, though. If right. you have a, it, it's not just CAT scans, but mm -hmm. I'm saying there's also, um, in like the medical field, there's, uh, there's a device where if someone is laying on a table, and you have uh, um, some sort of electromagnetic field that's generated around the body, they can test, uh, they can know position of um, small things in the organs moving, things like that, monitor um, all sorts of things based on that. Okay. So that is position based. That's position based. But that's, you know, a human body has all sorts of electromagnetic tissue and you know, mm. neurons and stuff like that so that's different because uh, well that's yeah that's that's a little, little outside of this field but isn't there something out there somebody with some probe that's measuring something that's wireless there got to be something out there I, I can only think of map digitizers yeah I think now they may be controllers right that, yeah. something like that yeah. so at, at least Again, depending on which, who you're presenting to, that may be a piece of knowledge that you should have at your fingertips or even put in your presentation. Yeah. Okay. But uh, this is really cool stuff. Very good. Thank you, Justin. Thanks, sir. Just Matt walked in. What's up, Matt? You're in town? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Justin, for the presentation. And now uh, I'll be talking about Prudence Corporation. Actually, I was expected to give a follow up presentation that what I'm doing, how I'm doing right now in US market. But I thought like, okay, it will be a very dry presentation. Uh, 
there are some experiences which are I'm like uh, I tried something in my bachelor's or throughout my life and it turned out into entrepreneurship and don't know how. So I just thought of like pinpointing some of the things which I have gone through and how that contributed and how I end up here. So my name is Sagar Patil and this is my story about Freelance Corporation. So when I was thinking that where should I start, I was thinking of starting from my birth, oh sorry, uh, from my undergrads, the starting point of my company. But then I went and I said like, um, still there were few things which were missing. So I thought, okay, I should go and start from my birth. And I will not spend a lot of time on it, but still. Uh, I was born in India, uh, but this was where I was born in a very small town in the north part of Maharashtra, which is a state in India. And <coughs> Uh, 1987, India. Uh, I went to a school, Kanasa uh, Convent High School, which was a Catholic school for 12 years. And when I was in my school, I spent most of my time doing the extracurricular things. All the extracurricular activities, all the, uh, whatever I saw, I, I went and did. I was also, uh, means the leadership kind of thing came uh, in me because from the uh, school days, I was a cabinet leader that time. Uh, we had like different houses, uh, like red, blue, green, yellow. And we had like competitions in amongst those houses. So I, I got a chance, I became a leader. And from there, like it started. Then thinking about like what I'm going to do in my future, I thought like, okay, money and like, power, everything, everything is okay, but suppose tomorrow if there is an earthquake, if everything goes away, what is going to be with me if I'm there? So I thought I should have mental strength and physical ability to do something. And I thought I can I can do something uh, if I go in defense, like in defense, defense is the right place. If I go in defense, I can uh, be mentally strong, physically strong, and that's what I need. So. From my 7th or 8th grade, I had this dream to go in defense and do something. I studied for those exams and I had all this in my mind. I wanted to go in Air Force. I appeared for the entrance exam of National Defense Academy and there were like 2 million uh, candidates who were for the exam and only 395 got selected for that batch. And I was among that batch. but. Uh, it was something called bad luck because we had a different kind of town system uh, where I was studying and uh, they were not ready to consider because I was not graduating when their batch was starting from my high school. So, uh, but with that, like defense was the thing I wanted to go. So I also tried for Armed Force Medical College. I tried for College of Military Engineering and there was a bad luck that uh, after the interview, I got the letter that you are selected uh, for the interview uh, when the interviews were done. So there was a lot of, and I felt like, okay, now what exactly? Means I had planned this for five, four, five years in my life that I wanted to go there, and that was like a turning point for me that what I'm going to do next. And I was interested in automotives and aeronautics, and so I thought, okay, I'll I'll go for engineering. I'll do my. Uh, Auto, uh, aeronautics or automotive engineering. I talked with some of my guide and they said that um, I should do mechanical engineering. That is better, it will form a base and if I want to do automotive or aeronautics, I can do it in my masters. So then I, uh, in my development stage in 2005, um, till this time I was in Dhule and then I went to a city called Pune uh, to do my undergrad in uh, mechanical engineering. This is the photo of my university, uh, University of Pune. And I took admission in mechanical engineering. I remember the first day of my class when I went there, I uh, my classes got cancelled. And I went out and I searched for which is the student organization, active student organization on campus. 
because I wanted to work and I wanted to do all the extracurricular work which I always did. So I went and I uh, found an organization which was Uh, Mechanical Engineering Students Association and this organization helped me to connect with seniors, juniors and um, like work in a team with that and I I did each and everything I could. Uh, I skipped all my lunches, worked for the organization. I was like so much dedicated. People renamed me with a name called MESA, it's the short form M-E-S-A. Everybody called me MESA. And now also like some of my undergrad friends called me Mesa. These were some of the events which I took. We took many competitions. In that place when I was like the president of that organization, I thought that how I can really give value to students by doing activities. So we did like all the technical, cultural, sports, all kind of activities. But this was only limited to my department. And I had this thing in my mind that what if like if all the departments unite and we make like a event which can go nationally like we can call people and then we started uh, we made a group and we started an event which was called Versatalia uh, this event was all uh, cultural uh, technical paper presentation robotics um, sports each and everything like there were 36 kind of competitions it was a five day long event we planned it and uh, we started it in 2008. We did a lot of activities. We completely, uh, this was my college and we did. Uh, we always took a theme. We thought about this that, okay, we are going to take an event. What different can we do in this event? If we take a social cause, um, we took Go Green theme for one year. And what we did is like, we got uh, many saplings and we went on a mountain and we planted it and we took care of that uh, one uh, in one year we took uh, child education because the uh, literacy rate in India is low so we went in um, some of the schools or we went outside we took some workshops for students so we always had a social thing attached to it This were like some, uh, I was talking about this, like we went and we did some plantation. Uh, if you know Wally, we, Wally was our mascot for that. This was the team, this was the main team for team. We had around like 500 volunteers to do this event and like everybody learned a lot and automatically like we, we made a structure like that, that a uh, junior is uh, head of a competition and he has some volunteers from uh, sophomore or freshman year and automatically they got trained and like they always thought my senior did this and how I can do something better than him so we had that kind of structure um, then I was always looking for some new opportunities when state level with my department I did national level with this and there were going to be games in uh, Pune. It was Commonwealth Youth Games. It's not as big as Olympics, but um, games were there. I went there, I wanted to volunteer for them. So, uh, I was registered as a volunteer. I helped them. Through my training, they saw me and they saw how I can do and they allocated me a team. Uh, they made me a team leader. This was my team. This was the venue for common games. Not a very good resolution. Um, I was very close to the people who were organizing this because I got uh, team they were there was a position for coordinator for the opening ceremony and uh, they uh, wanted someone. They actually had all the professionals in the coordinator position, but uh, they thought that I would I can do it. I was like only 19 years that time. And like this was the event, and I was the coordinator of the opening ceremony. Uh, like there were 18 different events, and I was the coordinator of one event. So that was a great experience. So uh, while doing this, I had my future plans, 
as I had thought, I wanted to do automotive systems and I wanted to pursue my masters. Um, I studied for the graduate record exam GRE and made applications. I remember I applied in Kettering in December 2008. I got admitted in June, uh, April 2009 and everything was set. But one thing happened in between. I was going to come here in October uh, for the fall term and uh, I was going to get graduate in 2009 from my undergrads. Uh, it was the final results were going to be out in the month of August. So uh, there was an e incident there, swine flu. Do you know about swine flu? Yeah. Like it was also here. So actually in India it started from the city Pune. And like it was spreading very badly because of the monsoon season we had. Like, so there is a uh, lot of, it is very contagious, contagious disease. So uh, many people died and they shut down the city for one month. And my results uh, got delayed by one month. It was September. I was not able to uh, come here. I got six months. And then I thought, like, okay, now I had planned this. I have got six months. What am I going to do? Uh, I didn't want to go for a job. Uh, actually, I had a job uh, which I rejected because I was going to come here. So I had a concept in my mind. And it was in my ninth grade when there was a dot com bubble i said like everybody is make, making website how they are making website the web hosting was a very new thing and i said like what if like i have some space and i give space to people and they just host the website like i i don't want to make my website but i would like people to make website on my server something like that and like if you see this the uh, i had designed this logo when i was in ninth grade and it was Vista Planet that time. But like I, I didn't register the logo when I was in ninth grade, so when I checked it after 10 years, it was not available. But I wanted the same one. So I made it double end here and set it at like Vista Planet. So on September 38th, I uh, got this company registered and I thought of like I'll do some web hosting for six months and when I'll go like at least I will get the annual uh, revenue from the renewals and like it, it was just an experiment I wanted to do and uh, for this I invited all my friends because of all these events I had a very good network of friends I exactly knew that you are opening the website yeah. <laughs> um, so <laughs> where I was um, with my friends I had a very good network um, each task which I gave to someone, uh, someone was the infrastructure secretary, someone was marketing, someone was... So we had a very good web lab. We knew that what that person can do. And I asked them like, okay, we, we can do this together and I'm going to go away in six months and you can continue with this and like add on service and then do that. But most of my group was from mechanical. Initially because of the recession, they said, yeah, 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 that's very good because they didn't have any other opportunity. They came in and they supported but as they got jobs, some left, um, and it was fine. But there were a few people who j were just there with me because I was doing well uh, and left me when I was not doing well. So it was a very good filter process for me to see who is with me and who is not with me. So I started with this service, web hosting. And I have a cloud server in California. Uh, which gives the best of time uh, and I give most of my packages are unlimited space. When I went into market, now I'm coming on credence, like my background is over, so I will go in detail with this more. With web hosting, I was going to give uh, this space to someone. So I talked to some of my friends who were a web developer, who were from computer engineering, like if they wanted, like they can get space from me. When I approached a customer, they said that, what can I do with the space? I, I, I want the complete website developed. So you find a developer or like you develop it for me, I don't care. And like that thing triggered me like, okay, uh, so website design development. I actually wanted to design my own website also. So I tried something in Microsoft Publisher. I used front page. I, I tried many things and I, I came up with 
some good websites i learned something some coding and stuff and then i went to the next service which was website design development uh currently i'm using all these technologies and my focus was only this that i want to design a website which will create customers for my customer it should not be just a web appearance so this uh, i recruited one employee which was a cs major and he started developing i went into market i got some contracts then i thought like okay i'm getting a very good profit margin and then i moved to my first corporate office which was like not so good but still it was in the core location in a pune city and uh, previously i was doing business just from my home like wherever i stay went to this then i thought okay um now I, whenever i'm approaching a person i'm asking that do you have a website and when he says he doesn't have a website uh then he's my customer but he says that i'm having a website then i have to walk away i said how i can solve this problem how i can provide a service to him which uh if he has a website also i can do it so i did some research uh, how i can do it and that time google india was very active and uh I got Google certified. So my next question to him was like, "Do you have a website?" And he said yes. Then I asked him like, "How much revenue did you generate from your website? How much customers did you really get from your website?" And then the answer was like, "Yeah, some like I didn't see it in that way. I, I get some." Uh, so I explained him like how we can do the advertising advertisement through Google AdWords. We got Google certified, so we did some. uh b2b portal registration and made uh like hundreds and thousands of ca campaign with the keywords for him and then he thought like okay i'm investing into marketing but my website design is not so good so he gave me a contract for website designing also so with this my uh i was raising some of my uh, other services also but uh during that era uh there was a new service in market which was Uh, very famous it was oh, okay um i talk about that as i already had like i, I was i kept on recruiting people uh, because i was getting uh, more contracts i went into uh, as i had a designing team i also designed some brochures and like whatever designing material graphic designing was required because i already had the team for that and i was saying about this service this was a corporate and bulk, bulk sms service in india we had a database of a city or like a state or complete country uh, of all the numbers and you can just uh, divide that database by pin code a uh, zip code so uh, you can send sms uh, if a company is coming to flint and suppose they are launching a product they can just come to us and like we will send a sms to each and every one like informing about them uh, it's it's a very different scenario in us but in india like I uh, that's a very famous service so I I'm a um, so one of the seven companies in India who got this service I I did a lot of work to get this but because of this I was uh, I I didn't want to sell my service directly to the customer because uh, I'm I was having the gateway I was having the license I cannot sell like uh, 100000 or 200000 sms the minimum quantity which i can sell was like 1 million or like uh, 5 million or 10 million sms to someone so there was a network uh, which were some of the company they were resellers and right now i have 1600 resellers which are using this service and they are they are reselling it to the customer so this brought a lot of revenue for me uh, it was uh, profit margin was not that much but still as the revenue was flowing in and if you get like uh, a credit period of 15 to 30 days also you have a lot of money to play with and uh, that helped and then uh, i started with a new service uh, i was thinking about uh, like super bowl we have ipl in india which is indian premier league it is for cricket and youtube was telecasting uh, live cricket matches and i thought that how i can get into this market how i can do it one of my 
client came to me and he asked for IP camera uh, thing like he, he, he was having a construction company and he wanted to install IP camera at a different location and his customer can log in and see what is the development of that site. I tried that but it didn't work because of the lower bandwidth capacity in India like the internet speed is very slow so you cannot stream data. So that was the big problem and live streaming that's why uh, so I thought like how I can integrate uh, I have a cloud server, I have this, how I can integrate this and uh, start this service and I started this and uh, like I was the first in the market with this and I got uh, many contracts and so this was live streaming then before coming here as I was uh, I had a group already of mechanical engineers who were working somewhere and we had a good network of people uh, in the market uh, we have worked with some industries for website design development. So uh, we started this CAD services and right now also we are doing good with this CAD services. Um, I thought while doing business, we should do some social initiative work also. Because if the social initiative is attached to your movement or like I did it in my college days, uh, so it will keep me like motivated, uh, going group, talk with people and so I did a workshop for students, like I gave them free website, uh, I explained them how to use Google AdSense to generate revenue from their website. Uh, I, I took like, now it, it was the last year data 13, but now it is like around 20, 25 workshops which are done and uh, we were invited from uh, Indian Institute of Technology which is a very one of the best schools in, in, in India for uh, engineering uh, to deliver the workshop. Um, this were like some of our promotion and uh, we had some stalls and some of my presentations for the team. We sponsored many events. The event which I started, uh, Versadalia, I went and sponsored it after two years. 2011. So, one day I was sitting in my office uh, because I had deferred, I kept on deferring my admission for masters. Is this it? Like, what is what is my future? What am I going to do this? Am I going to design website throughout my life or will I be in this IT services? And I, I wanted to do something different and I said like, okay, now this is the point. I should go and like get more exposure. Whatever is running, it was an experiment, now I should stop here. So, but I didn't want to give up whatever I have made. So, I spent six months to stabilize everything and uh, see how it can work without me. And now, uh, like all my offices are working without me. I came here, I changed my degree uh, from automotive systems to engineering management because I thought that, okay, I can do well in business. Uh, I, I have a passion for automotive which I can learn but if I take some business courses that will be very helpful for my future. That's the area which I want to go now. So I came here and I, I started coming to Catering Entrepreneur Society from last summer. I took guidance from Professor Tavakoli like how I can start business here. There were like very uh, pro uh, many problems because I'm an international student here. So I found uh, a person, um, Don Dawson, he's a good friend of mine. And he also had passion like me to like do something different. And we started Freelance USA, Freelance Corporation in USA and got incorporated in October 6th, state of Michigan and it is as a C Corporation. And we did some projects, uh, I think it's because of me, I didn't do it properly, so it's not a thing. Um, we got some projects about e-commerce and all that. Uh, this was the website, uh, which, which was Smart Energy Solutions. It's in the west part of the state. And we re redesigned the website, and this is how it looks right now. This is our first job in US, which we did. Then we did the website for campus printing here. Then uh, there was, uh, if you were here in Springtime, you know my life secret. Uh, 
my life secret had a website and they wanted to redesign everything and this is the new design sorry about that then this is under development and other than this like we got uh, many marketing uh, we did some graphic designing work because I was working with uh, campus printing and he had many people coming in they wanted the graphic designing stuff done so I got many graphic designing I did a couple of live streaming contracts in Paris, Michigan because of Don's contact and uh, I did some web marketing jobs for uh, campus printing as well as for uh, the smart energy solution and I started my operations from January 2012 though it was registered but I was like preparing for everything so till date this is my like, overview uh, currently like uh, including uh, India and US I have around uh, 150,000 uh, turnover. Um, it's 125 something, uh, 2025 in India, and rest is US. Total workforce of 35, including me. Uh, Vipul is my uh, director of operations. Don is director of marketing and sales. And I have one more person in Washington DC. He is uh, working as a region manager. I'm trying to get some live streaming contract for George Washington University. So. This is the current stage. I want to take credence. Now, I have a platform set. I have a very good portfolio um, of what I have done here. And the next stage I want to go is to go into manufacturing or industrial. I have done mechanical engineering. This is not, this was just out of interest. So I want to start something and that's why I want to work somewhere before I so I'm in the exposure stage right now. So um, I thought that this would be more valuable to the society, just uh, showing like what I'm doing now, how many projects I got, and what is my overview. So this was my story. Thank you. Thanks. If you have any questions. I'm here. Uh, but uh, before you ask questions, uh, where is Bipul? Uh, He's not there. Uh, can you call him? Uh, because he has to. Uh, we want to discuss because it's nine, and we want to discuss about this. I'm here. If you have any questions, you come to me, and we'll talk. Let me take a minute for your stuff. Okay. I want to ask the room something. What did you see in his behavior? that has created all of this. What's his reason for success, if you're willing to call it success? Persistence at hard work and just working and working and doing different things, not necessarily for profit, but it ended up being that way. Did it seem hard? No, Was it hard for you? Did it seem hard? When I'm getting dedicated in something, like yeah. I just want the best for it, and I don't see what time I put into it. I mean, I didn't get the feeling that he was working hard. He was working, obviously. But he wasn't suffering, right? Yeah. Okay, so what else do you see? I think what I saw from like an early age is that you just have a, you had a constant drive that kept, you, that kept you going. Like, from the time you went into college, you know, the activities that you got involved with, you put in 100% effort into just whatever you got involved, involved in, you know, with that organization. And then, you know, your companies that you got involved with as well, you put in, you didn't stop, you just kept going and you took the initiative to accomplish what you wanted to, to do. And I think it's the, the drive that really makes you stand out. Lots of curiosity, yeah. right? Yeah, how can I do it? Not like, right. I can't do it. Right, but lots of willingness yeah. to just try stuff. Like, and I mean, and, he, and he's already like accomplished so much, but he's not even done. It's like this is this is just the beginning. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, I forgot to put I every in every presentation I put, but like I did it just it it was over before fifteen minutes before I came here. And because I didn't know like what I'm going to put in this presentation and I was working on it. I always put that this is just the beginning. Uh, there's much to explore and this is just the beginning. Okay. At the end of all my presentations. Yeah. I, I see something. You developed a lot of friends and networks 
and you kept using them, not in a bad way. I mean, like right now you're saying, hey, I got the, somebody in Washington. That's a person you know, right? Yeah. I mean, that's pretty incredible. I, I just keep feeling up, man, this guy just kept planting seeds right. everywhere and keeping friends and networks. You know, and that's, by the way, what you guys should do in college before you get out. You will never have such concentration of friends. I keep telling you this. Make friends and stay in touch. Seriously. This is an amazing network you guys have. Once you get out of the, you know, as you go out, your life keeps getting narrower because you get into offices and cubicles and whatever it is you do. You know, it just keeps narrowing. You get wife and kids and stuff, you know, that <laughs> it starts narrowing. This is a good time, so make friends. And the people who know me here, like I, when I say sorry to Dawn and like all the people who are working in the US, like I'm not able to devote, I'm, I'm devoting only like one or two hours now, like per week to Credence USA. I'm not at all like, I'm not getting any time right now. But I said like, this is my last term, I want to do KS because uh, if I'm not able to do it, then when I do it in my life, okay. This is, I'm not going for PhD anymore or I, I won't be in school. So, student organizations was always <laughs> where I wanted to be. That's good. Man. Congratulations on all this. This is it's awesome. Your story is a great story to tell. Um, the one thing that, you know, seeing Steve Jobs in there, it's uh, the way that he defined what, what he worked on is, is more about what he didn't work on. And our stories, mine and yours, are like very like spot on similar, like eerily. It's like you see the Go Green shirt, like, I. I designed that, <laughs> and it's like, I mean, they're, they're, it's crazy, but um, what I found is that uh, you get to a point where um, people are going to ask you to do things, and you can do them, but you have to say no at some point, point. and I, I'd be interested to hear what situations you came up upon, whether it be live streaming or a technology solution, where you had to say that's, that's not... That's not where I want myself to go. Even though, even though there's money sitting there and you can take it, it's a distraction to your core services, and you're letting down other clients by by routing resources there. Do you come across that, or or, or do you want to, or do you want to be an empire? Because that's an option too. Oh, I, if I see like something different, if I don't know that technology also, I'll go and like try to learn that live streaming and I, I never knew what, what it is, how that operates and I did some research. I, I, I don't say that I invented something which I can patent but because of the research I did, I found out a way that how I can do it. Uh, I don't know how many people, means it is very easy, means it, it, it is not easy but they need to see that uh, it was completely into different industry and I applied it into this industry. So. Um, I came up with this, uh, Don was talking about like, okay, uh, we can go to radio stations, they wanted to do like audio streaming throughout. I said like, okay, that's not where I want to be, like these are my core services right now, and I want to concentrate on this, because if, if there is a reason to innovate further, like, uh, I will do it, but let's first build a base here in the US, with whatever services we have. Sure. Where do you see yourself in five years? Like what do you ever consider like any long term? Oh, see, my plans. Whenever I plan, it like I plan for national defense. I gotta be it went away. Uh, I plan for like coming here and doing automotive systems. It changed. Now, I have a plan, which I don't know if how it is going to work. I want to work with a company, which will where I can get maximum exposure. I'm trying to see a company which is not having its operations in India. So if I work with that company for two or three years, I can ask them like, okay, we can do it in joint venture, like kind of thing in India. Uh, want to get some maybe into alternative energy or something. I don't know, but I just want to do something which I like. And that was the main thing. Last week when Ready Force came and I was like, I was thinking this, I want to work in a mechanical industry. I have done four years of mechanical engineering. I want to work in mechanical. But then I saw this and I said like, fine, but 
will I be happy there if I go in a big company and they gave me a set of duties which I just have to do and I cannot see outside, then how I am going to do it? So I felt like startups can be the place where I can really go and do it. Uh, means my, I don't see or I don't consider myself as an entrepreneur because like this is something which was done into, and it, it was just done. Next, what I want to do is entrepreneurship. Like, go in a uh, means plan and like calculate and go. Just not like do experiments. Experimenting will help. But you're exhibiting a lot of entrepreneurial mindset. So that's what mindset is, it, or a behavior, or whatever you want to call. It. I mean, you're not afraid to try something new. You, you, your curiosity drives you. In, you know, you're saying alternative energy. I don't know anything about it, but you don't say it as if, oh man, how am I going to learn? Yeah, you're open to it. So With those are a lot of entrepreneurial behaviors. I think what you're saying is that you like to now become an intentional entrepreneur, right? Like literally build a yeah. business. And fine. And you will someday, you know. Yes. Where did he go? Did he disappear on us? I don't know. <laughs> can, you can, can you see him? Because I... I I was just prepared for the, actually I was not prepared for the presentation, I throw in, I found photos, I throw it in, I was discussing with Justin from two days like, how I'm going to present, I wanted to present, but should I do it on Prezi, should I do it on PowerPoint, what kind of presentation I'm going to go and like, I just Prezi came, good. today 3 p.m. I got the idea that, okay, I'll, I'll do this kind of thing. <laughs> so, for the seed grant, um, uh, apart from this, what do you think can be a next step for credence right now? I have built a good pace. Uh, I want to go further with my services. I'll get some time after this, maybe. Have you gotten any offers from like any larger companies that want to buy you out? Actually, one of my uncle's company wanted to buy me out. No, like they just wanted to because I was going again. They said like they wanted to get out, and they offered me a deal, but I didn't go for it. Right. So, I mean, like it seems like what you've done so far. You have like all these different components of your business and you want to keep doing more but at the same time you just you want to put you feel like you said like you're sort of down about not putting that much time into it and, and have you considered just like maybe selling it or handing it off to some somebody and then moving on to something no bigger? there are two things now see uh, I like to do new things right. uh, when I was doing if, if I went to SMS if I went to live streaming I was working on that but I made sure that if I'm moving to that this is not going away or like the, it, it is not giving a poor quality I I made it sure I, I kept people who can now when I came here I would have just given the company to someone to handle I sit at night because India and US is in completely different time zone and I monitor the operations at night what is going on or it's not like only the main things I have office managers who report I have done a reporting structure so you have to also see that you maintain that because then the business will go down and the name will also fall apart. I'll, I'll, I'll lose my image in market. So I can't do that. If I have started Prudence Corporation, and if I'll close it one day, but I'll never sell it. Do, do you think you're a, there's, there's something you call a genius leader? And it's a type of person that the business only runs if they're in charge of it. Do you consider yourself, do you consider Prudence nice. Corporation that type of person? Uh, it happened. In one year, I had a turnover of 100,000. Uh, 100, when I came here, now they are just, there is no innovation. And you know about IT industry because you are in IT industry. Like, every day it is changing. And if you cannot update yourself and provide new services, like, then you cannot charge that much for it. And in India, the inflation rate is going, by, going up by 10% every year. So I had to give hype to each and every one in six months, all my employees. So if you see my profit is squeezing down, but still I'm trying to maintain it. Uh, the bulk SMS service, because now government has imposed so many rules on it, the bulk SMS uh, is going away. So I'm facing all these problems right now. But still I think like, okay, uh, if not in India, how I can have maximum international projects and cover that thing. And nine months doing part time or like doing whatever time I got, we got a business of 25 to 30 thousand dollars. So if I give some more time, I think we can do much better.
Yeah, I think so. I, I think it sounds like you are in that group, though, that the, the company will yeah. fail without your assistance. I have given the power of attorney to uh, one of my friends who was with me in my very good time also, in very bad time also. And if I want to do something, like future also, he will be with me. And that's what I want. I want people, good people with me. And then that's what I, mean. I can trust him. Um, I think Vipul is not there, so we'll just go with the grant. Justin? Yeah. Uh, can we just uh, say two points about the grant funding thing? Is it possible? Okay. Um, so, how, do we have enough to pass, like, pass these out or something? Like, you know, we were supposed to get it print out, but we've, uh, I'll send you an uh, email attached with this copy today. Uh, you go through all these rules, because these are very important rules. We are going to follow this this time. Okay. Do you want to go through all this right now? Uh, just the main points. Okay. Like what are the requirements and how the grant presentation should go. So the reason that we're covering this right now is because next week will be the grant presentation, so next Thursday um, for the, the people that have signed up. So right now, as far as the uh, the requirements, so there's team requirements, and then there's sort of the you know about who's re making the request, and then also uh, the funding themselves. So as far as the teams, so there's three main bullets for that. Um, team members must be recognized as KS members. So this is really for um, trying to get involvement out of the members and looking for at least one term of involvement. And then, secondly, the team also must be um, have at least one Kettering student actively involved. So the reason for this rule is because of we, we've had some involvement from outside universities and we're trying to make sure that they partner together and we can see some of that growth amongst the teams. And then the third one is that it, um, it must also must be uh, recognized within the state that its operations occur. So we're looking for you to, to establish your businesses and start um, thinking long term about your businesses if you're requesting uh, funds to support them. And then for the, uh, the funding restrictions, um, suggested limit for the business venture. So there's, there's kind of three different categories, or is that what it is, or two. Um, tinkering, uh, proof of concept category, and then also this business venture. So for the business venture, the, the suggested limit is $3,000. And then for the tinkering and proof of concept, um, that's around 1000 um, as far as what's not funded previous previous expenses, so the way the funding process works is that you pay you you go out and purchase the items that you're looking to to uh, to acquire, and then the society reimburses you after. So we're looking for the learning process to be involved throughout this, and that's the reason for the previous expenses not being funded. Um, and then also that items deemed capital goods ex uh, capital goods such as laptops, um, you know. Any sort of thing that you can take away from the business and walk away with, um, we'd be funding at a 50% match. So you put in 50%, the society puts in 50%. So one of the things that I know that Tavacoli wants me to tag onto this, um, as much as it pains me, is that every single one of these is up for petition. So <laughs> it still pains you. It does. <laughs> so um, so <laughs> when you're up there presenting, if, if any one of these items you want to. You want to try to sway the society's opinion to, um, I, don't, I don't want to say violate, but to, to maybe go around some of these. You need to provide a very good, um, saleable case for why you think that it's uh, applicable for your situation. So let me justify why Justin and I have had this different opinion for years, <laughs> seems like. So you all are all aspiring entrepreneurs. One of the primary essential talents of an entrepreneur is to convince others of their opinions, their ideas, their passion, their plans, and take their money. So that's why I have always resisted making rigid rules. However, we got to have rules. So we put the rules, then we put an asterisk on everything. Is that if you think that you ought to break these rules, convince the society. Okay? So that's the essential reason, as opposed to just saying, this is it, take it or leave it. So we're leaving that door open uh, for you to say, for this reason, I think I should be an exception to the rule. And if you can convince your peers, well, then you're a good entrepreneur. At least you get a good start. 
And believe me, I've sat through this room for six years now, and you, the evaluating members, can see through everything. You really can. Collectively, you can see through everything. And you always give good advice to the people that are asking for those exceptions, and you invariably, if they're willing to listen, you know, after we get over our emotions, if they're really willing to listen, you improve their ideas for them. That's what the society is really about. So it's not about money at all. It's about improving. So that's why kind of that asterisk has always been there. And Justin nodding his head, he says, that's not a bad idea. And then next week he'll disagree with me again. <laughs> no, I just not. Okay, man. I quit playing it and just let him explain it every time. Um, so I for, like it. So after that, going forward, so the way the rest of this term is going to look out for as far as the seat grant process, so we have week seven, week eight, and week nine. So week seven next week, obviously, will be the presentation. So we're looking for um, the 15-minute presentations from each of those teams followed by 15 minutes of discussion. And then the, the last two weeks are really luck for um, debating the line items and approving the final presentations. So um, I think right now, how many teams do we have? Two? So three? Yeah. So really it comes down to how many teams we have represented and whether or not we will end up using uh, those full two weeks or not for week eight and nine. Okay. Sound good? Um, now we can start our networking. Uh, did you mention what's being presented next week? Line items only, not okay. money. Did we discuss that? Yeah. In the seventh week, you don't have to present any of your financials. Just present like, okay, I need help with marketing. I will need like business cards or like website or anything which is going to go in. I need to uh, go for some capital expenses and just give that item. Don't give any kind of price, whatever you need. So seventh week and in the eighth week when you will come back to go in detail and that is called a deep dive or we can say like financial approval thing. That time you will show your finances. So we have already approved some of the line items and we now you can see like what is the best available for you in that category and we can do the financial approval. So, so just to re-emphasize, re this is a new procedure for this term. This is what happens every term to us. People get up there and say, I need this stuff and it's going to cost this much. And then we get so hung up on the dollar values that we forget we're supposed to be here to help this person. Okay? So we get so hung up on, should we give them the money, should we not give them the money? Then we stay here till like 10.30 and then people start fading and, ah, just give them the money or, no, don't give them the money. Yeah. So this next presentation is going to have no dollars in it. The people who's making the presentation to you as the committee who's going to approve or disapprove it is going to tell you what they need. So first they give you their business idea, which you've already heard once. So the first thing you're looking for is, did they take your advice? Right? Because you gave them a bunch of advice the first time you heard them. Whether you were here or not, this society gave them advice. Did they take it? Or if they didn't take it, do they have an answer why not? Okay, remember, they're entrepreneurs. They're supposed to convince you. Okay, so you, you get past that. Then they say, this is what I specifically need, item-wise, no monies. I don't care if it costs $10 million or $2. This is what I need. That gives you a chance to discuss that with them, to say, do you really need this? Maybe you should think of this instead of that. Do you really need 10,000 business cards where you are in your business idea? Because remember, that's where you're helping them. And that's what it's about, right? Helping each other, right? So once you get past all, and by the way, the burden on the presenter is to be very specific about what they want. Don't get up there and say, I need 3,000 bucks for marketing. You better have a marketing plan. Exactly what do you need it for? Oh, I need 2,000 bucks for a website. Well, what kind of website? Why is it costing 2,000 bucks and not 200 bucks? So think it through, right? If you're making a presentation next week, that's, that's what you're asking for. You better have details. And then the society will decide if that makes sense for your business and all of that. And great, approve, disapprove, whatever, right? 
and some suggestions, and then they come back next week and they tell us how much it really costs. Okay, and then we say, oh wow, okay. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> okay, if it's too much, too little, we'll work on we'll work through the dollars. But remember, the, again, the, don't forget our prime objective in this society is to help each other grow our ideas and get better at thinking like entrepreneurs. Money is always secondary. So we don't want to get hung up on it, but we have our limits and limitations and budgets and things too. Right? So that's what we're doing. This is the first time we're trying to get that way. This process, every term, evolves and improves, in my opinion. But it, every time somebody comes up there, they challenge us with something we didn't think about. So we kind of react to that and try to improve it without shutting people down. Like, for example, one of our criteria is that you have to have been here at least one term. Right? Why is that for? Well, because we've had situations where people showed up here two meetings and asked for money on the third meeting, and we don't know who they are. That's not the primary negative. I mean, it's okay. It's better for us to know you. But the main negative that goes against our mission is that we didn't have a chance to work with you. So we didn't get the benefit of your experience, and you didn't get the benefit of our advice. So if you've not been here for a term and you're going to go up there and ask, you better convince the society why you're there. Okay? I mean, you're, I'm not saying no, you shouldn't. You should get up there and you tell them, you know, look, my idea is so well cooked up and you can see it. You know, it's ready to go. If you can convince the society that it's ready to go and everybody says, yeah, man, this is perfect. Let's go. But if you can't make that argument, that means that you're not ready. And I'm saying this because it's not about the presenter. It's about you guys that are evaluating. You better be thinking like this. Okay? Because that's, that's where your value to that person is. Okay, whoever's up there next week. All right? End of my spiel. Okay. Uh, whoever not signed up, please sign in before going. And uh, the presenters, if you have any doubt about anything, you come and talk with us. And we will have a leaders meeting next Tuesday. So uh, if you want like, to talk with all the leaders and like, uh, explain, you want more explanation about the rules or like, so we can help you in that. Just let us know. OK. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. See you next week. Awesome.